anything? Must be. Come on. You're not frightened now, are you? No. Where does your excellency come from? I am from heaven. Who are you talking to, Lucia? A lady. I don't see her. Where is she? Here, on the little tree. Don't you hear her? No. Tell him to say the rosary. Then he will see me. She says to say the rosary, Francisco. What is it you want of me? I come to ask you to come here for six months in succession, on the 13th day at the same hour. Then I will tell you who I am and what I want. Shall I go to heaven? Yes, you will. And Jacinta? Also. And Francisco? Yes, but he will have to say many rosaries. Lucia, I can see her now. I see her plain. Do you wish to offer yourself to God? To endure all the suffering he may please to send you? To help atone for the sins by which he is offended? And to ask for the conversion of sinners? Shall we? Yes, we do. Yes, my lady. Then you will have much to suffer. But the grace of God will be your comfort. My God, my God, I love you in the most blessed sacrament. Say the rosary every day to obtain peace for the world and to end the war.
from in Mark space. Mark Cameron. This is from Mark Cameron. Whilst in space, have you ever looked away from Earth into the black void? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, because yeah, you time. can see yeah, yeah. cuz you can see the stars. Oh yeah. yeah. You know, and, and uh, pretty much all the time you can see yeah. the stars. Yeah. It's, it's not which a black cool void. Thing. I mean, it's black, but there's all kinds of little polka dots. There's all the there's all the stars there. And the cool thing is about it, you can see it during the day. Yeah, you can and there's more than stars. You can see planets. You can right. see moons. You you see the ga the gas uh, the Magellan clouds of yeah, the Milky yeah, Way galaxy. Yeah, yeah, you see Magellanic clouds. Magellanic, see, I, was, yeah. I just wanted the then, Magellan well, clouds. I didn't want a small one, right? Mr. Armstrong, I do realize that when you were on the moon, you had very little time for gazing upwards. But could you tell us something about what the sky actually looks like from the moon, the sun, the earth, the stars, if any, and so on? The sky is uh, a deep black uh, when viewed from the moon as it is when viewed from uh, cislunar space, the space between the Earth and the moon. The, uh, the Earth is the only visible object other than the sun that can be seen, although there have been some reports of seeing planets. I myself did not see planets from the surface, but I suspect they might uh, be visible. When you looked up at the sky, could you actually see the stars and the solar corona in spite of the glare? We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. Uh, I don't recall during the period of time that we were photographing the solar corona what, uh, what stars we could see. I don't remember seeing any. Yeah, so as you can see the stars. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, and, and uh, pretty much all the time you can see yeah, the stars. Yeah. It's, it's not a black cool void. Thing. I mean, the sky is uh, a deep black. We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optic. Yeah, so as you can see the stars. The sky is uh, a deep black. We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface. You've been living in a dream world, Neil. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes.
Jupiter's retrograde is very shallow, if I can get my star to go on. Jupiter goes like this, it slows up, it doesn't blink like that. <laughs> and it does a very shallow little circle, kind of a little like that. Yeah, it kind of looks like a halo over somebody. So did Jupiter do that at an interesting time? Well, yes, it did. Let's take a look. I'll animate Jupiter and let it drop a tail so you can watch it. Jupiter passed Regulus, changed its mind, stopped and went back for a second close approach. That's two. Passed Regulus again, changed its mind, and came back for a third close approach. Triple conjunction, much more rare, much more rare. And if you choose to see it, Jupiter has just drawn a halo or a crown over the king planet. Interesting. I can see king there, can't you? I can see king, 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 right? Some people would say, well, king, 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 you know, new king, or maybe it means birth. I don't know. I, try, I can't get much more out of that, but I do see king there. Very true. A lot of stuff still missing, though. I mean, I don't see the Jewish nation up there any place. So, of course, there's more. Next, I want to ask you a question. Um, Twelve Jewish tribes, one produces Messiah. Which one? Anybody know? You're right, say it louder. It's Judah, that's right. What's the animal symbol for the tribe of Judah? That's correct, okay, good. Let me take you to the first book of the Bible. And look at Genesis 49 for a prediction of the coming Messiah. We read, you're a lion's cub, O Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom the scepter belongs, and the obedience of the nations is his. I need a prop. I'm going to use this for a prop. You all know what a scepter is? The thing that kings hold to show that they're kings, right? I want you to remember the scepter is going to show up again. Okay? So this is a prediction of Messiah coming in his role as king of, of king of kings. Well, that association with the Lion of Judah, that helps us. Let's go back to the sky. If we look at the sky and turn on the constellations, we'll see that Jupiter has been crowning Regulus right here in the constellation Leo the lion. Well, now I can see an association with the Jewish nation. I can see King, King, King in Leo. Well, that's pretty interesting. That's pretty cool. But there's something even bigger that I got to show you that really spooked me when I saw it. And to do that, I'm going to take you back to the Bible, to the last book of the Bible. We've just been in the first book of the Bible. Now we're in the last book of the Bible, Revelation. And I want to talk a little bit about Revelation first and about its author, because you, I want to make sure you're all on the same page. Um, it was written by a man named John. Uh, he wrote five books of the New Testament, including the Gospel. He wrote Revelation when he was an old man. He, 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 and, and under dire circumstances, the guy was uh, on the island of Patmos, basically locked up for his Christian beliefs. And he was there, most commentators think, for six to nine months, and basically solitary on a rocky island. And he was old at that point, maybe probably in his 80s, maybe almost, could it even be 90s? And that's when he wrote the book of Revelation. Now, now all of you who've read it, you know it speaks in a swirling prophetic imagery, you know, and it's a, it's, a lot of it seems metaphorical. Sometimes it's not chronological. It's a difficult book. It's a difficult book to interpret. But uh, I can't explain most of it. I can, though, explain a little. I'm going to go to Revelation 12 and show you a corner that I think I understand. Let's take a look and see what John describes. He says, A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. What is the sign? Well, I want you to watch this. It's a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon at her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns on his heads. If you understand this, please email me, okay? His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. Hey, here's that scepter again. Who's the child? That's Jesus in his role as king of kings. We saw the, pre the prediction in Genesis, and here in Revelation, he appears again, and he's got that scepter, because he's now the king of kings. So, if the child is Jesus, who's the woman? Yeah, that's pretty easy. Okay. And in, in, in metaphorical terms, who's the dragon that waited at the, at the foot of the woman to devour the child? That's Herod. The dragon is Herod. John elsewhere tells us in Revelation that the, the dragon is Satan, but we know in human terms it was Herod. So we now understand what he's describing is the birth of Jesus, but he sees it in the heavens. I'm going to show you something now that definitely got all the little hairs up on the back of my neck and on the back of my arm. and Because uh, what follows Jupiter into the sky as we animate the sky is Virgo. 
the virgin. And she's clothed in the sun. And she has the moon at her feet. It's just a crescent moon, a very small crescent, barely a visible moon. There's a reason for that. This is Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah. The sheer weight of symbolism in the sky on this day blew me away. In September of 3 BC, when Jupiter is coming in a close conjunction with Regulus, the king planet and the king star, that happening in Leo, the lion, representing the nation of Judah, the tribe of Judah, that rises in the sky and behind it rises Virgo, the virgin, and she's clothed in the sun and she has the moon at her feet. It's exactly what John describes in Revelation 12. It's what he saw in his vision. It's obvious. They couldn't zoom, but we can, so I'm gonna zoom in, way in. Until finally, I get those two objects separated. One of them's Jupiter, the other one's another planet. You're gonna tell me which one, too. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. That's the mother planet. Venus is the mother planet. So we have Jupiter, the king planet, and Venus, the mother planet, coming into very close conjunction. That seems kind of pregnant, doesn't it? In fact, they got even closer than that. Let me wind time forward just a little bit. What I'm trying to show you is that they really stacked like a figure eight. So they didn't block each other's light, they added. What you had then was two stars stacked on top of each other, too close together to separate with the naked eye. And so to an observer, it appeared to be the brightest star anyone alive had ever seen. Um, you, we know the math, and so I can tell you that no one alive had ever seen a star that bright. That was it. I believe the star of Bethlehem was the brightest star. So we've seen the birth of a king in the sky. We've seen the brightest star. But now we have the issue of it being in the south. Remember when they were traveling from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, the star is said to have been before them, ahead of them. In the, so it would have to be in the southern sky. So let's go back to the sky, see if Jupiter did that. They've now traveled to Jerusalem. It's November, I've given them some time for travel. This is south, remember uh, Bethlehem is due south of Jerusalem. And then seven in the morning, sure enough, there in the sky, in the southern sky, is Jupiter over the little town of Bethlehem. In September of three BC, Jupiter crowns Regulus in Leo. Up rises Virgo, clothed in the sun, new moon birthed at her feet, Rosh Hashanah, Jewish New Year. Nine months later, the biggest planet goes together with the brightest planet to make the brightest star anyone alive had ever seen. Where? Right over Jerusalem as it sets. The Magi ride. They get there uh, sometime around November. They go to Herod and they say, we've seen the star, where's the baby king? Uh, Herod says, uh, Bethlehem. So they're leaving uh, the gates of Jerusalem to go to Bethlehem, five mile trek. Uh, and they look up and there's the star, there's Jupiter, right over this little town of Bethlehem. One of the guys, he's the guy who does the math for the group, He's going, wait, 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 wait. It's in full retrograde. It's stopped right over the little town of Bethlehem. They ride down to Bethlehem in 1225, 2 BC. We know that's the date because that's when the star stopped. They're carrying gifts, remember? Frankincense, gold, and myrrh. They find the baby boy. Is he uh, living in a manger? No, 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 no. He's moved. He's in, a, he's in a house now. He's described in Greek as a pideon. He's a toddler. They find the baby boy and they present these fabulous gifts to him on what turns out to be the first Christmas, 1225 of 2 BC.